All right, let's talk about solubility and alloys for a minute. Um, when we think of solid solutions or solubility in metals, these are also a type of imperfection, right? Instead of having a completely pure lattice, you have something else added to it, some other atoms, right? And the truth is, is that almost essentially no metal is 100% pure. It is really hard to get metals past 99.9999% pure. That's six nines, right? And for electronics in the electronics industry, when they make circuit boards and things, they're typically using silicon, which has been purified to 99, there's nine nines, point nine 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 percent pure. So that's incredibly pure, right? But even there, you still have impurities, right? You still got impurities present. Now, oftentimes, uh, it's, it's wrong to think about, oh, we need to get metals as pure as possible, because in reality, we often design alloys to have mixtures of elements, right? An alloy means that it's not a pure compound, it's been alloyed with another metal, right? So there's some really famous alloys or solid solutions out there. You've probably heard of sterling silver before. Well, sterling silver, you just start with 92.5% silver and you add 7.5% copper. And why do you do that? As we will learn in a future chapter, when you put impurities in the lattice, this actually strengthens the, the material, it makes it much stronger and harder. So if you're making jewelry, right, like a, a sort of earring, if you add that little bit of copper, for one, it makes it cheaper, right, because the silver is the more expensive component. But two, it makes it stronger, so it's less likely to get bent or damaged, right? So it has some benefits in addition to making it less expensive. It has more desirable properties, like mechanical properties in that case. Stainless steel, we know that adding about 12 or 13% chromium in iron makes a corrosive uh, corrosion resistant barrier on the surface of the steel. The chromium forms chromium oxide, which is a really great protector. It's a passivating layer, right? And therefore you get stainless steel. Um, how about pewter, right? That's 6% antimony and 1.5% copper in tin. Brass, you can add all the way up to like 40% of zinc in brass to get lots of different types of brasses out there. Bronze, uh, if you take any metal other than zinc or nickel and put it into copper, you're forming bronze, right? So, for example, tin and lead gives you casting bronze, right, for making statues and things. Um, there's cupro-nickel. This is something where you have up to 25% of nickel in copper. And why do you do that? Well, because copper would corrode really quickly in seawater, but adding up to 25% of that uh, nickel gives it seawater corrosion resistance. Same thing with Munts metal. Um, same exact thing there. Um, solder, you know, I was just using this today. Um, solder, if you can see that there, it's tin 63, lead 37, it says. Um, that's because it has a eutectic. It allows the solder, which you want the solder to melt at really low temperatures because you don't want your soldering iron to have to get crazy hot. You want it to get, you know, to some temperature and easily melt the metal. And so that's an example of, of an alloy that we use. Um, and then steel, of course, is a mixture of iron and carbon. So a lot of times it's wrong to think as metals like, oh, we have to get as pure as possible. Instead, it's right to think of it as what's the right alloy? And adding such and such an element, what property does that imbue in my material? All right? So uh, if we're going to be making alloys, a fair question is, all right, if I'm mixing, let's start with just two elements for a minute. If I'm mixing them together, where are they going to go? Are they going to replace one another? That's substitution. Or are they going to fit in the gaps between the other crystal structure? And that would be solubility in the interstitials, right? So it depends. It depends, right? Uh, you've got substitutional and interstitial possibilities for where the atoms can go. So what are the determining factors? Well, size, charge, crystal structure, and electronegativity are all really important ones. What does size uh, suggest? Well, if you have a really big ion that's coming into the lattice, then it's probably going to be substitutional. Why do we know that? Well, again, think about it. If you have your lattice made up of a bunch of atoms and interstitial sites, right? Here are the uh, smaller interstitial sites. If you have a really big new atom that's coming in, let, let's say that this is our new atom, it's that large, how are you gonna put that on this tiny little site? You're not going to. Instead, it's going to kick out one of these purple atoms. It's gonna have to crowd everything out, push it out of the way a little bit, but that's a lot better than the interstitial site. So again, if the incoming atom, the impurity atom coming in is large, it's probably gonna be substitutional. Now the same thing is with charge. It says here, lower charge ions tend to be substitutional. Well, what do we know about that? Well, as you go from the pure atom, let's say the pure atom is this big, when you go to one plus, it gets smaller, two plus, it gets smaller, three plus, it gets even smaller, right? One plus, two plus, three plus. 
right? It's getting smaller and smaller as you increase the oxidation state, right? Because the same amount of positive charge is present in the nucleus, but as you remove electrons, it's going to squeeze that electron cloud tighter and tighter, right? Therefore, for the same reason as before, a big atom is going to be substitutional. A really high valence one will be smaller atoms, so it might be interstitial, okay? Crystal structure, uh, basically, if they have, uh, if it has a really open crystal structure, then the odds of it having uh, big interstitials is larger, and so you, you're more likely to end up with interstitial sites. If it's a really close packed structure, it's going to be harder to put those in the interstitial sites. Um, electronegativity, if there's a really big difference in the electronegativity, meaning that you have elements from the, like, the different corners of the periodic table, it's less likely that they're going to substitute, and it's more likely that they're going to instead form an intermediate compound, right? Those things are going to react with one another. We know that the larger difference in electronegativity leads to higher ionic bonding, and so that's going to just be more likely that it forms a bond instead of substituting interstitially or, or as a substitution. And we can see examples of this. Let's take a look at the copper-nickel phase diagram. You've seen it before in this class. Copper-nickel phase diagram has solid solubility all the way across, meaning these things can perfectly substitute one for another all the way across, right? from pure copper to pure nickel, uh, and, and unless you go up to a point where the pure copper melts, and then you go across this liquid, solid plus liquid, and then solid region, right? So let's look at these atoms. If you look at copper and nickel, their radii is almost identical, right? They're the same size. They are both FCC crystals, right? In their pure form, like pure nickel and pure copper are both FCC. Um, the electronegativity of these is very similar one to another, and they both have the same charge. So is it any surprise that these things substitute for each other all the way across as opposed to looking at interstitials or an intermediate compound? So uh, the opposite then would be true for interstitials. You're looking at really small radii impurities, so things like carbon, hydrogen, maybe nitrogen. Um, those are going to be a little bit more likely to be interstitials because they're going to be really small relative to the larger other ions, right? And typically, even if they are small, it's hard to dissolve more than, say, 10% concentration into a lattice uh, because it's still straining the lattice. Stuffing these into the interstitials is straining the lattice, and so eventually it's going to say, there's no more room. You've strained the lattice too much. Go out and form a secondary phase instead, and that, and that will happen, right? And we've seen that in iron, right? The maximum solubility in ferrite was only 0 0.022 weight percent of carbon, which is tiny, and in the austenite phase, it was only 2.14 weight percent carbon, right? And that was, uh, you know, 100 times more, but still not all that much that you can dissolve into it before you hit the limit.